The subject of today's video is a disease that as many as 882 million people are at risk of contracting. It causes the debilitating swelling in the arms, legs and genitals, leaving patients with constant pain and discomfort. In today's video, we will cover the symptoms, causes and treatment of elephantiasis, often termed the neglected disease. It is perhaps helpful to start with a description of the symptoms and causes of elephantiasis, otherwise known as lymphatic filariasis, so named for the parasitic roundworms that infect a patient and result in the condition. These worms and the disease are endemic in a number of places, in particular India, Southeast Asia and Central Africa. These worms are transmitted by infected mosquitoes, who when taking blood meal from humans can deposit the worms into a person's bloodstream. The worms make their way to the person's lymphatic system, a vital part of the body's immune system. There are three types of filarial worm that can cause the disease, with the most common being the Wucheria bancrofti worm. Once in the lymphatic system, the worms will begin to reproduce, resulting in millions of larvae entering the patient's bloodstream. As the worms mature, they can grow to a length of 4 to 10 centimetres and continue to reproduce. At this stage, the patient, if bitten by mosquitoes, can lead to further infections. As the mosquito takes blood from an infected person, the larvae will infect the mosquito and continue the cycle. As the larvae multiply, the person's lymphatic system will become clogged by the worms, resulting in a reduced flow of lymph fluid from the tissues. This backed up fluid and the person's immune system response triggered by the presence of worms will then cause swelling and inflammation. The first signs of the disease will present around 4-7 to seven days after the mosquito bite. The disease can largely be divided into two stages, acute and chronic. During the acute stage, the patient will present with a fever and swollen lymph nodes in the groin and armpits. Pain will begin to present in the arms, legs and genitals, as these are the areas most affected. With the damage to the lymphatic system caused by the worms, the patient will be at higher risk of infection as the immune system is weakened. Lumps will begin to form in the person's arms, legs, breasts and groin as the disease begins to take hold. Following this, abscesses can also form. Some patients will present with an allergic reaction to the presence of the larvae in the bloodstream. This is known as tropical pulmonary eosinophilia. This will result in violent coughing fits, trouble breathing and damage to the spleen. If untreated, it can lead to permanent damage to a person's lungs and affect their breathing capacity for life. Elephantiasis is not a widespread killer, but as it weakens the person's immune system, they are more likely to die from other infections of diseases. If untreated, the disease will become chronic. The swelling and lumps will become permanent. These lumps will continue to grow in size. They can weigh many kilograms and have been described by some patients as akin to constantly carrying heavy luggage under the skin. If untreated, the swelling will cause deformities to a person's arms, legs and genitals. The skin on and around the lumps can become either spongy or thick. Where it becomes spongy, indentations can present in the patient's skin causing pitting where it takes a long time for the skin to return to the correct position. When the person's skin gets hard and thick, it is often referred to as elephantized, so named as it looks akin to an elephant's skin. In both cases, folds will develop between the swollen skin and the crevices prone to fungal infections. Hydrocele's, that is swelling in the scrotum, can be a common symptom in males. As of 2008, as many as 51 million people were understood to have been affected by elephantiasis. Not all elephantiasis, however, is caused by the parasitical roundworms. Non-filarial elephantiasis is caused by exposure to irritant alkaline soils when walking barefoot. The symptoms are similar, though also include a moss-like skin growth, leading to a disease that has been called mossy foot. Diagnosis between the two is important. Blood smears can easily reveal the presence of roundworms and larvae in the bloodstream. Blood tests can also reveal a higher number of certain types of white blood cell deployed to deal with the parasites. Now, this next part is rather bleak. Ultrasounds of the genitals can reveal what is rather disturbingly called the filarial dance. That is the movement of worms in the person's lymphatic system in the scrotum. 
The non-filarial version can be identified usually by looking at the location of the patient. For example, those living at higher altitudes away from mosquitoes or on volcanic soil are more likely to contract it. This version also rarely affects the groin, allowing for simpler diagnosis. There is unfortunately no cure for elephantiasis, but it is preventable. Methods of controlling or killing mosquitoes can reduce the infections, so too can personal protective gear or mosquito nets. For non-filarial elephantiasis, proper foot hygiene, the wearing of shoes and decent flooring is the best prevention. And of course, reducing exposure to irritant soils. Other preventative measures for filarial elephantiasis may sound extreme, but include chemotherapy treatments. This can reduce the larvae that are present and reduce not only the spread to others, but within the body. Combinations of these methods have all but eliminated the disease in many countries, including Egypt, Vietnam, and Sri Lanka. There is currently no vaccine capable of protecting people from the infection. When a person is understood to be infected by the roundworms, the most common treatment is the medicine diethyl carbamyazine. This treatment is usually taken by mouth for a course of a few days. This drug does not outright kill the worms, but rather it weakens them, allowing for the body's immune system to better deal with the parasites. For those with chronic conditions, the treatment will be much more invasive. Often, it will require lifelong care for those affected. Surgery will be needed to remove excess flesh and growth along with skin grafts to help heal the affected parts. There is often no full recovery, as the damage done to the body will often be irreparable. What they can offer is a significant reduction in pain and swelling, whilst increasing mobility. Many of the chronic cases are caused by a number of factors. Whilst it might seem obvious to some to seek immediate treatment, it is not always possible. For many, elephantiasis carries with it a stigma. The disease causes deformalities that many are made to feel ashamed about, particularly when it affects a person's genitals. As the disease progresses, mobility becomes ever more difficult. For those in villages, far away from readily available medical infrastructure, even reaching help is an impossible task. All of this leads to a place of hopelessness and isolation, many feeling that there is no hope for their condition and that they are beyond help. Outreach programs and medical professionals visiting such villages and expanding the help available allows for many to retrieve the treatment they so desperately need. Some clinics offer a mix of surgery, yoga and compression bandages to help deal with the chronic cases. As for the history of the disease, there are accounts in the Shushruta Samhita, which is one of the oldest written compendiums on medicine. Written in the 6th century BC, it lists the disease as Slipada, meaning elephant leg. This is a term that persisted through the identification by Roman and Greek writers. However, the condition was often conflated with leprosy. It was not until 800 AD that Persian scholars addressed the confusion, along with descriptions as to how to treat the disease. There are also depictions of people with elephantiasis found throughout history. Some notable examples include the carvings from ancient Egypt, along with paintings from feudal Japan. In 1862, French surgeon Jean-Nicolas de Marquet first identified the roundworms responsible for elephantiasis, found in fluid which had been extracted from a patient's swollen scrotum. In 1876, Joseph Bancroft, an English surgeon, identified adult roundworms in patients' lymphatic abscesses and found larvae in patients' blood. Elephantiasis is currently a disease being worked on by the World Health Organization. In the year 2000, the WHO launched the global program to eliminate elephantiasis. The strategy in dealing with the disease was twofold. First, it sought to stop the spread of infection. This was to be achieved through large-scale annual treatment of as many people as possible in high-risk areas. Secondly, it sought to alleviate the suffering caused by elephantiasis by ensuring that people have access to the required essential package of care. As of 2020, 58 countries met the criteria for considering the disease eliminated as a public health problem. Many countries were able to stop the widespread use of preventative drugs altogether, but there is still work to be done to ensure of its complete eradication.
By the year 2030, the WHO predict that 80% of countries endemic with the disease will have it eradicated. Elephantiasis is without a doubt a truly disturbing disease, from its spread by mosquito, to its cause by horrendous parasitical worms, to the debilitating deformities caused. Thankfully, there are many ways to prevent the disease, but as is often the case, it is vital that access to education and healthcare be available. The added element of stigmatization only makes the disease that much worse. Empathy and understanding about the disease are essential for it to be treated properly and avoiding the chronic cases, and hopefully for its eradication in the near future.